We're now joined by the mayor-elect of Freetown, Yvonne Aki Sawyer. It is so wonderful to have you here. So tell me, as an African, how important is it for you to be at a conference like this, which is all about unstoppable Africa? I think it's really important. I'm, I'm, I've enjoyed the morning, listened to a number of speakers, had the opportunity to speak myself on what we're doing in terms of energy in the city over the five years that I was mayor. And as I come back into the administration, some of the plans that are already underway. Um, how important is it? We can look at this from so many angles. On the one hand, the population of Africa is the youngest in the world, mm -hmm. median age of 19. Um, in countries, in other parts of the world, people are struggling with aging populations, diminishing workforces. We've got the opposite, opportunity. Um, at the same time, we're in a, uh, a period of time where the climate crisis, on the one hand, is devastating many parts of Africa. We are low emitters, but disproportionately impacted by the consequences. But the flip side is that as we look at a green energy transition, renewable energy is something that Africa has the potential to really build on. Already, over 40% of renewable energy leaders are on the continent. But that doesn't really translate yet into energy touching everybody's lives because we still have a huge energy deficit. As you would be hearing already this over the course of today, 600 million people on the continent without access to energy. Almost a billion people without access to clean cooking technology. In order to solve a problem, you have to have a solution. Mm -hmm. And that solution, by definition, is an opportunity for Africa. It's an opportunity for investment. It's an opportunity for change. It's an opportunity to propel. We also have leapfrog opportunities. Yeah. I'm in a city where we've never had public transit. So we have 80% of our population using low occupancy, high emitting vehicles. The motorcycles, we call the vocadas, and the um, kekes, the three wheelers. And we are a year into a two year feasibility study to introduce a cable car. And that will be transformative. We'll be cutting travel time from east to west of the city from two and a half hours to 20 minutes. And we'll be moving 6,000 people in an hour. The cost of that at the moment as the, as the team are working through the feasibility is still south of $50, uh, $50 million. That's nothing. Uh, and it's an opportunity for private public partnership, an opportunity to improve the quality of air because it will cut our transport emissions by 25%. So whether it's green energy, whether it's cooking technology, whether it is job opportunities, there is so much potential. We're doing Freetown the Tree Town, hashtag Freetown the Tree Town. We started mm -hmm. in 2020, it was a two year plan to plant a million trees in our city. Mm -hmm. We are almost there. It's taken three years, but by the end of October, we would have planted 1 million and 50 is gonna be That's fantastic. trees. And that planting is not just planting, it's growing. So there are green jobs created by this. I'm just giving you a flavor of and where the opportunities are. And being here is about joining the dots. And the opportunities are huge. You've just laid out what sounds phenomenal, right? In, especially when it comes to green energy in this transition. But what do you need in practical terms from now until next year when we're back at this conference to really implement these potential ideas and make them a reality? Finance. So you heard me say feasibility study. Mm -hmm. um, and, that, and to raise the finance for the feasibility study, you're gonna find this so hard to believe. It took us three years and it was $800,000. That's not a lot. But to take, when you talk about a crisis and you talk about potential, you can see there's a mismatch. People are saying the capital's out there very bankable project. Good news is the feasibility study is now underway, but we're going to be looking for that capital investment for that cable car and being able to join the dots. One of the great things that happened just now was that I was on a panel and two of the speakers work in the carbon credit market. So I got off the stage and I was like, we have to talk. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a million trees. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the purpose. And, and you know, but, but I think beyond that, it's also raising the expectation and the mm -hmm. ambition um, and definitely ensuring that people are aware of some of the great things that are going on um, because there's also scale and scope for replication. But if you ask me again, 
what is it we need to happen between now and next year? Finance needs to move. And where do you need the finance to come from? So are you looking for private pu uh, public partnerships? Are you looking for investment from outside? Or are you looking for investment from the continent? So there's no one answer. I think it's a combination. But there's a context that we need to look at. There's a context of high debt. Many countries are in debt distress and are spending a considerable amount of their GDP on debt financing. Right. Um, so that in terms of the, the, the space for them to actually invest, as well as the risk perception, that's a challenge. So there has to be a structural engagement on that. And in the last few days, whilst we've been here at the UN um, General Assembly meetings, I've heard a number of calls for consideration to be given to, to debt forgiveness. And this is in the context of loss and damages. Because if, you, if we come back to this point about Africa being responsible for emitting less than 4% um, of the greenhouse gases, and yet we're disproportionately impacted, that impact is pulling back on the de in development. That impact is drawing on resources that aren't there. So if there's a gap to be filled and if there's debt to be serviced, there is a logical and a rational argument to be made about loss and damages adjustment funds being used to work towards mm -hmm. that debt forgiveness. So there, that's a contextual sort of piece. Um, coming back to the blended finance, which is what you were saying, basically, combination of PPPs, combination of you know public sector funding, private sector funding on its own, and philanthropy is also a piece mm -hmm. that um, exists, obviously much smaller, but is there and and can be used to leverage. You know, at the end of the day, it was a philanthropist that funded our cable car feasibility study. So there's no money in it, but this is a determination, a commitment to see a green solution implemented to make the project, bring the project to the point where the finance, uh, the, the, the um, investment money can come in. So, you know, when we talk about climate, we talk about green energy, renewable energy, it seems like a lot of people are waking up to the fact that Africa is obviously very rich in those resources and that potential. But when it comes to other sectors, what do you think it is that investors outside misunderstand about Africa? Hmm. I, I think it'd be interesting to, I think it'd be interesting to, to look at how risk is measured. Um, and to just maybe stand back and question whether um, the historical classifications, you know, and, and formulae that go into determining political risk, country risk, are actually fair, you know, um, and, and balanced, and that there isn't sort of um, historical sort of prejudice. I mean, that said, we also have to be we have to be clear, you know. I, I live in West Africa. I'm from West Africa, and in the last 18 months, there have been five coups. Now, having a coup doesn't necessarily mean your business environment is completely thrown apart. Um, we've, seen, we've seen changes of government, which may not have been democratic, and we all want to work within a democratic environment, don't get me wrong, um, but I also appreciate that there's an, er there's an urgency of movement. And could we look at insurance policies you know, obviously they're already there. You know, right. we have things like MIGA um, from the World Bank, but it's not really accessed that often. Um, we need a rethink. We also need democracy. It would be good to have rule yeah. of law that would keep things, you know, sort of at an even pace. But um, I think we, there has to be a recognition that we're seven years away from the 31st of December 2030. And we had big ambitions for where we're going to be. Africa has a role to play in that. And we may have to, you know, be a bit more adventurous, you know, maybe take a little bit more risk um, in order for us to get there. I had a conversation um, earlier this week with somebody who works with central banks in Europe. Um, and she said to me, one of the challenges we see now with the flow of funds is the fact that Europe is now increasingly a higher interest environment. You know, gone are the days when interest was like half percent, mm -hmm. um, and therefore the, the Africa interest rate or the Africa equity return seems so much more appealing. If you can get high returns at home, 
it, it can be a pull. So that's where we need structural decision. That's where we need the political will. That's where we need the loss and damage. That's where we need the appreciation that if, if global warming is negatively impacting a continent that was not responsible for creating this, there has to be there has to be compensation for that. And that compensation can really go into business, can really go into investment and fuel the growth that we all need as a, as and, a globe. And also just a reset, when you think about this new global climate that we are living in, that any investment in Africa has to work for the African people and not just for the people outside. Absolutely. It. But you know, you mentioned the coups and in, in West Africa and, and, and I just want to you know say that obviously there's a lot of bad role models, if you like, for Africans to see, but also so for Africans, when they look at you as a woman, you know, you are the mayor elect, you have previously served as a mayor of Freetown. That's really important, especially when it comes to, uh, you know, the gender dynamics on the continent for little girls to grow up and to Absolutely. see that this is a woman who is serving in the government and I could be like her. So how important do you think it is that there are more female role models on the continent and how uh, and how do you ensure that you are using your position in a responsible way to uh, empower other girls? Okay, so super important, super important. And when I ran for office, I ran because of climate. I've actually been in the private sector my whole life and what drove me to run for office in 2017 and the election was 2018 was my concern for the environment. I had not in any way anticipated, I hadn't thought about it. I'm, I'm from a family of four girls. We only have girls. So I've grown up believing that women are doing, can do everything, you know. It was, I've never been such a, my, my dad just really celebrates us, pushes us, and so I, I didn't really have that. Thank goodness for him. I'm very grateful. <laughs> I look back now, he's 87, just celebrated 60 years of marriage with my mom. Wow. Um, and I look back and that really impacted my sense of self-confidence and awareness of my ability. Um, and potential. Um, so coming in as mayor, during the election, I was constantly asked, do you really think you can do this? Because it's not an appointment, it is an election. Excuse me. I was constantly asked, you know, is this a job for a woman? Can you really do this? And I was like, I don't understand. Why are you asking me these questions? It's a job, you know, I, I can do it. <laughs> um, but when I became mayor, um, I, I suppose then I began to understand why. Um, from challenges that I had with, you know, with those who want to not understand that women can lead. Um, but more importantly, I think, from the number of young girls and women who reached out to me and said how inspired they were. I mean, I think one of my most uh, moving moments was when a girl who must have been, she must have been about four, it was for their nursery school Thanksgiving, and they had to choose, or, or play or something, they had to choose a person to be. And her mom came to my office and my PA was like, you have to see her, you have to see her. And she came and she read out my whole CV and she, get, she went, and who am I? And I was like, you're the mayor. That's <laughs> so sweet. I know, I, we actually have it on videotape. Um, but, you know, consequently, a year ago, I set up a foundation, Yaz Girls Leadership Foundation, because I realized there are many, many young girls who just needed to be told, you can do this. So um, I, you know, move around the country and I meet girls in schools. Um, I don't do it as often as I'd like to, but as much as, as often as I can. And I tell them, you know, it's a, it's a, the, the, our motto is give her wings, watch her fly. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, it's been a pleasure to speak to you. My very last question is, so I hope to see you here at this conference next year, but tell me what is a couple of concrete things you would like to see happen at next year's Gabby conference? Well, I think it'd be great for things to happen in advance of the conference. We've got 12 months. Um, and in those 12 months, coming out of this, as I've said, I've, I've made connections, but potentially there's an opportunity for the database to be shared with everyone um, and for some thinking to be done maybe by the team about who might be connected with who. Mm -hmm. I think um, Gabby can use its, its platform to add its voice to the call at COP28 for the loss and damage account to be funded um, and for it to be operationalized. So that between now and next uh, um, conference, we actually see money move. You know, get commitments from company, countries to, to put money in and a process for drawing money down. Um, and, and maybe finally, I'd just say, um, 
the the good news stories that, that Gabby is telling are, are absolutely wonderful and they should keep on doing that. Um, but maybe reach down um, to a social media or well, social media platforms where average everyday people are hearing about some of the great things that are happening on the continent and can be inspired. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. It's really been a pleasure. Thank you.